I'm going to record it here, and we're recording as of now, so don't no right. hot mic moments. Uh, and uh, thank you, Peter, for remembering me. I, I also, I often think of it after the meeting and tell Peter, darn, we forgot again. <laughs> yeah, great. Great. And thanks, John, for being uh, open to that. We should, I'll make a note of that when I do housekeeping at the beginning Dude, of the meeting. If there's great. any issues, just let me know. Great. Totally All right, great. are we ready to let everybody, let the first wave in? We've got 20. Yeah, let's go ahead and let everybody in. Very good. Happy New Year. All right. Happy better New Year. Gotta be better. <laughs> already more entertaining. <laughs> Outstanding. Lots of faces I haven't seen in quite a while. So I uh, want to welcome everybody to the uh, our, our uh, maiden voyage in uh, 2021 uh, for our luncheon. And um, uh, just a quick reminder to everybody: if you if you haven't already uh, renewed your membership, uh, we are uh, you know in the process of doing that. We run on a calendar year. Uh, pro the easiest way to do that is to go to our website, which is demcenturyclub.org, and uh, just follow the prompts there. You'll you'll see where to join or renew. Um, and uh, we've we've got uh, lots of work to do to make sure that the uh, local party and the our local officials and the Biden administration succeed in this first two years. So your membership uh, helps us to support the county party. Uh, that's that's our primary goal. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me um, welcome a few elected officials that we have with us uh, today. I'll just I'll just list them so that we can uh, uh, acknowledge them. Uh, Susan Ellenberg, Santa Clara County Supervisor for District Four. Uh, Pam Foley, San Jose City Council. Uh, Jody Muirhead uh, is board president of Santa Clara Uni Uni Unified School District. Uh, Jose Luis Pacheco is Oak Grove School District trustee. Rob Rennie is Los Gatos City Council. Pat Showalter, Mountain View City Council. John Weed, Alameda Water Board District. And Ellen Wheeler, Mountain View Wisman School District trustee and Patrick Ahrens, who's uh, Foothill De Anza Community College. And of course, uh, our party chair, uh, Bill James is with us today as usual. So uh, let, we're, we're gonna do uh, a little two minute breakout where you'll, you'll break out into uh, small groups, much like uh, if we were at a live luncheon, these will sort of be the people at your virtual table. Uh, say hello, introduce yourself. Uh, maybe uh, see somebody you haven't seen in a long time, maybe introduce yourself to somebody new. So uh, we'll take a couple minutes to do that and then we'll get to our main speaker. Uh, Bill, you wanna go, go ahead and do that? Oh, that's beautiful. Oh yeah. My, gosh, so sweet. <laughs> um, my name is Kelly Ryan. Um, I, I actually live in Solano County, uh, but my son and I came down a few years ago and went to the luncheon and we just loved it so much that we came a couple of times and then my son came with his dad too and we're, we're still on the email list. So when this started, you know, we just 
uh, have been doing this uh, pretty much almost every month. And it's been like one of the highlights of the pandemic. So he's out of town, but I'm I'm holding on the fort. So. Wow, Kelly, I'm going to share that with the leaders of the club because they'll be thrilled to hear that uh, that this has been a, like a little lifeline for you. That's, that's kind of neat. Oh my gosh, yes. It's just, it's been wonderful, yeah. Fabulous. Uh, my name is Mary Mabin, and I've been a Century Club member for a long time. Hi, Steve. Hi, Bill. Hey. Um, and uh, just very happy to be here during this time. Thank you for joining us, Bill. Oh, my pleasure. I'm dropping in. I'll probably have to slip out because Craig won't want me to keep these things open for very long. Did you already introduce yourself to me? <laughs> Yeah, Dwayne was the first one to go. Okay, and I was second. Oh, you did. Okay, so I came after you guys had already gone. So I'm Bill James. I I'm wearing my Navy sweater. I'm a former Navy veteran. Went to law school out here in the Bay Area. Met my wife. Had three kids who are teenagers now. Two, <laughs> one in middle school. And uh, I'm keeping myself busy as the county party chair. So uh, wow. I've known Steve for a very long time. He and I've been in central committee for decades now. I think <laughs> together. <laughs> uh, and uh, so doing this hard work in this century club has really helped build a good Democratic majority around here. So. Really happy to be able to. Yeah. Good. Well, since nobody's going to be bringing any food to our table, I'm going to pop out of here and do this <laughs> room, uh, so we can get John Nichols. Well, happy New Year, Bill. Happy hope New Year to, to all of you. Hope to see happy you in New the New villages year. soon. Oh, I know. I would love to be in the villages room in the actual uh, place where you meet. Uh, I, I hope we'll be able to do that in 2021. Okay. We'll look forward to it. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, I'm a kind of, I haven't. Sorry to those who were in the waiting room. Uh, we were in a little breakout room chatting uh, and uh, the team was all, I guess, in conversation. So welcome. Hello, thank you. Everybody should be coming back in a minute or two. All right. I think these are closed in a minute, Craig, if people don't yeah. see the invitation to come back. Here they come. Here they come. There's somebody tapping out a call for distress in Morse code on the glass. <laughs> yeah, that was me on my coffee cup. <laughs> <laughs> I said that. I'm not quick enough to know what the message was. <laughs> it sounded like but and uh, it was um, w w welcome back in. in <laughs> okay, well, uh, I uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker today, uh, John Nichols, uh, Peter's going to just explain to everybody how you can submit questions uh, that uh, that John will be uh, dealing with. So, Peter, you want to go ahead and explain to people how they can submit questions? Yeah, um, every folks should be fairly familiar with Zoom by this point, I hope. But if you're not, no problem at all, um, because they keep changing their interface anyway. So we're all learning every single day. Um, so a variety of ways uh, that you'll be able to submit questions for, for John to discuss with us um, once he's done with his presentation. And we're saving quite a bit of time for the questions. So uh, feel free whenever he's as he's speaking, if you have a thought or a question you'd like to ask, drop it into the chat box. And to access the chat, most of you should be able to, to go down to the bottom of your little Zoom window, and there should be a little uh, sort of thought bubble or spoke speech bubble there, and the word chat, just click on that, and the chat should come up on the right-hand side of your screen or somewhere in your screen in a pop-up, and then you can uh, drop your comment in. Make sure you direct it to everyone, otherwise I won't be able to see it, or you can direct it to me personally, I guess, if you want to. Um, and then I will do my best to get every question um, uh, brought up. If I see a lot in the same vein, I might take the liberty of consolidating. Um, so just be aware of that if I don't get the wording of your particular question in there. Um, and then if uh, if you're unable to use the chat or if you'd prefer um, just to speak, you feel free to use reactions. Go to reactions, little smiley face, and raise your hand. 
And if you do that, I will see that and I will call on you so you can you can ask your question um, verbally. Is that and if anyone has any questions th throughout, just wave your hands frantically or drop a question into the chat as far as the, the housekeeping goes. But thank you again. I also put some links in, Craig, just so you know, in the chat for um, if you'd like to renew your dues or if you'd like to uh, get, in, get on our auto renewal plan, which is good for three years. So it locks in the same rate for the next three years, but it is going to automatically charge you the date that you uh, you sign on every year for three years. So be aware of that. Um, and I know it's, it's, I've already noticed that a few folks are definitely not so sure about whether they've renewed already because a couple of you have renewed twice. Um, so I'm work, I'll, we'll work with you on getting that sorted out. Um, but please, if you ever have any questions or you're, you have debate at all, um, send us an email at info at demcenturyclub.org and I'll put that in the chat as well and we can sort out your membership. That's all. Take Great. it away. All right. Well, let, let's let's get right to our uh, featured speaker. Uh, I'm really tickled today to um, uh, have uh, John Nichols as our, our featured speaker. Uh, John, uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with his work, is a national affairs correspondent for The Nation magazine. Uh, he also uh, is writer for The Progressive and In These Times, uh, as well as Capital Times, which is a daily newspaper in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, also frequently appears in the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and dozens of other newspapers. He was also in uh, a film by Robert Greenwald uh, a few years ago called Outfoxed, which had to do with the Fox Network. Uh, some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, he's featured presenter at uh, conventions and conferences, uh, including the Congressional Progressive Caucus, the AFL-CIO, uh, the Rainbow Push Coalition, the Newspaper Guild. Uh, he's written many books. Um, my favorite uh, is, I believe, his most recent one, which is called uh, Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party. Uh, I, I really find in, that, in this, these times of pandemic, when there's so much to be uh, upset and down about, uh, I found it uh, unusually inspiring. It's uh, a story of the enduring legacy of uh, Henry Wallace's anti-fascist, anti-racist politics. Henry Wallace, uh, you may know, was the FDR's uh, vice president in his third term and would have been his vice president in his fourth term, except at the last minute, Harry Truman uh, uh, nudged him out. Uh, John has also collaborated with Howard Zinn uh, on many projects and with uh, Robert McChesney. Uh, he's a founder of uh, the uh, uh, journalism um, reform group called Free Press. And, oh, I wanted to end with this, with this quote that I thought was fun from uh, Gore Vidal. Of all the giant slayers now afoot in the great American desert, John Nichols' sword is the sharpest. So without further ado, welcome, John, and uh, we're anxious to hear your thoughts. Well, that was a very kind and very thorough introduction, exactly as I wrote it. Um, <laughs> and so I appreciate you very much for taking the time to, to do that. I appreciate everybody for joining us today. What a great group. Uh, it looks like a good sized crowd and, and I am uh, thrilled to take a moment out from feverishly watching the madness in Washington to be uh, in, in a little bit of conversation with folks out in what we refer to as America. And I'll go right into the, the details of what we're talking about here and give a little bit of a, a sense of where we're at politically uh, and then move back into uh, some of the, a little bit of the history there, but ultimately get us quickly to your questions, which will drive a a lot of what we're doing and, and I hope make for, make for a good bit of the afternoon here. Uh, we'll get you out uh, within the hour. Uh, and so nobody's, uh, nobody has to be fearful of, of us going for too long. Um, I, I don't think that it would be appropriate to begin anywhere but with the uh, fundamental reality of the moment we're in. And that is that uh, we have a president of the United States who on Wednesday incited uh, a riot uh, with the purpose of trying to overturn the results of the 2020 election uh, in which he was defeated. And this is huge. It is literally unprecedented and, and it is something that is jarring, uh, I, I think to all of us, not necessarily jarring or shocking that Donald Trump did something 
uh, destructive and damaging and uh, potentially disastrous for the country, but that it went this far, that it, it got to the point that it did. And we should acknowledge up front that we don't know all the details of how this invasion of the Capitol occurred. We know what happened, we know what we saw. We don't know all the details of how it was organized and the extent to which there was collaboration between uh, those involved in the invasion of the Capitol and uh, Republican Party operatives, Republican Party insiders, potentially elected officials right up to and including the president. What we do know is that the president appeared at a rally on Wednesday in which he incited the crowd to march to the Capitol. Uh, his language was incendiary. It was uh, encouraging of an aggressive approach uh, at a time when that was, I think, uniquely inappropriate, not only because the arguments they were making were false and, and destructive, but also because uh, when a president of the United States lends his name to and his, his prestige to a moment in which uh, there are people who think that the fate of the country is at stake. And remember, right-wing QAnon types have been told that this is literally a moment where uh, the worst people in the world are about to take over the country. If the president of the United States lends his name to that, um, he cannot help but be seen as in inciting uh, not just the invasion of the Capitol, but, but frankly, some of the violence that occurred in relation to it. And at this point, we have five people dead, including a police officer, uh, we have uh, evidence of a great deal of destruction within the Capitol. And uh, we have the reality that the process of certifying the election of the president of the United States was interrupted, uh, even if only for a few hours, by a, a insur an insurrection. And that's, that's the term that ought to be used. It was seditious. It was uh, deeply troublesome. And we should be conscious of what's occurred. Now, what are the proper responses to that. Uh, to some extent, the, the first and most important proper response was to complete the process of certifying the election of the new president of the United States. That was done on Wednesday evening. Shockingly, um, more than 100 Republican members of the House and a number of Republican senators continued with their false uh, arguments and continued to support the false argument that there was something wrong with the 2020 election and voted for an objection to the results from Arizona and to some extent supported objections to results from Pennsylvania. Um, but that process done. Now the next process. Donald Trump is still president of the United States for mm, about 10 more days and a little more than that. And there are proposals to impeach him. I do believe that that's likely that next week sometime the House will be called into session and there will be a, a vote to impeach. I don't know that because it hasn't been formally structured and announced, but Nancy Pelosi has announced her support for that. Um, House Judiciary Committee, Jerry Nadler has said that he believes that articles can and should be brought to the floor of the House uh, directly rather than an extended hearing process. And so my sense is that sometime next week, there's a very good chance we'll be watching Donald Trump's second impeachment. Uh, in this case, they will, there will be votes for impeachment from Democrats and at least some independents and Republicans in the House, or at least uh, one Republican has signed on, Adam Kinzinger. There may be more. Uh, in the Senate, you'll have a mix, if indeed it gets out of the House and goes to the Senate for a trial. Uh, there will be at least, I imagine, some Republican support for removal of the president, certainly from Mitt Romney, who supported the last impeachment. There may be more. Um, do I think that we're actually at the point where the president will be removed before the end of his term? I'm not sure that. I, I would say that the betting is probably against it. Um, however, I think the impeachment effort is not only legitimate, but necessary. Uh, it's important in a moment like this to lay down a marker and say what happened was wrong. And the Congress of the United States, to the extent that it is possible, will object to that, will impeach the president who did it, and will seek to remove him, even if that does not ultimately occur. Does two things that are important. One, it, uh, it applies a, a proper response to the historical record. And there, we're talking about precedents here, and that's important. Uh, Trump would become the only president in history to have been twice impeached. Uh, and it does, it is an important part of the, the discourse. Secondly, 
it forces Republicans to uh, make a choice, especially in the House, and if it got to a, a Senate trial and vote. Uh, it's very, very important that uh, there be clarity here on who has aided and abetted Donald Trump and what he's done and what he continues to do. That's not a partisan statement in this regard. It is simply a reality that um, when something so egregious, something so severe as the invasion of the capital of the United States in an effort to prevent the certification of presidential election results occurs, uh, you want to know where people stand on that, and whether people, uh, whether people believe incitement toward that activity is appropriate. And so getting the, the actual roll call to occur in the House, at least, is an important, important step. So that's the baseline of where we're at. Let's step back for a moment and talk about how we got here. Um, you know, look, the, the important thing to understand about the 2020 election is that it was an election that occurred in a, at a point of chaos in American uh, history, both recent and long-term. And the chaos had to do with the COVID-19 pandemic, which amazingly enough, we, we do not discuss at the level that we should. You know, we have 350,000 Americans uh, who died. Um, millions have been infected. Uh, hundreds of thousands more will die. Uh, millions more will be infected. There is a vaccine, but it is being rolled out in an incredibly slow and many argue incompetent way. And there's deep, deep concerns about the, the circumstance we're in. That colored the whole of 2020. You had a pandemic and an economic crisis that extended from it. And frankly, uh, Donald Trump should have been defeated by a much wider margin than he lost by. Uh, it is shocking, frankly, at a moment where you have a pandemic that has been so badly responded to, so badly handled, when you have an economic crisis that has seen mass unemployment and business failures, when you have an unmet cry for racial justice that, that extended far back beyond just the pandemic moment, but that was amplified after the, the killing of George Floyd, when you have a climate crisis that uh, has been deliberately and willfully neglected by the current administration, and frankly, when you have a, a set of economic priorities that allow the wealthiest country in the world to see hunger, homelessness, and extreme poverty, um, clearly there's a lot to deal with. There's, there's a lot in play. And that ought to have led to an overwhelming rejection of Donald Trump. It didn't. And it led to a substantial rejection of Donald Trump, uh, but not to the kind of swing that you might have expected in the House and the Senate. You didn't see a 1932 uh, result where, you know, literally Franklin Roosevelt sweeps in with a absolute governing coalition in, in, in a position to create a new deal. Why did that happen? I think there's a couple of reasons that are significant. First and foremost, it is absolutely true that we're a very divided country. Secondly, uh, there is a, a change in our media system that can't be underestimated. We have a radically different media today than we had five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. This new media allows people to live in bubbles where they can get all their information from people who not only reinforce what, uh, what certain folks wanna hear, but also who frankly uh, deal in propaganda. And the propagandizing uh, impact was seen in a very powerful way with what happened on Wednesday. Those people who were there in Washington I mean, you can, you can favor their investigation and prosecution for those who committed crimes. There's no question of that. However, you should also be, understand that many of them are uh, literally delusional. They have, they have lived in a, in a fantasy world, and much of that fantasy world has been driven by so-called media that reinforces conspiracy theories, lies, uh, falsehoods, and frankly, hypes people up to uh, be engaged at a level that uh, is, as we saw on Wednesday, dangerous. Now, that's not the whole of our media system by any measure, but it's a substantial part of it. And we have to acknowledge that that does you know, reinforce divisions in our society that, that are consequential. Finally, though, and this is what I wrote about in my book, um, there is the reality that the Democratic Party struggles to present itself uh, as a coherent political force and, and it's not new that the Democratic Party has struggled to defeat uh, folks who should have been easy to defeat. The fact of the matter is, uh, it should have been easy to defeat Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was a brilliant communicator, charming man. I saw him in many settings, 
but, uh, but his policies were terrible, destructive to the country, and, and he was not prepared to be the president that the country needed at the time, but he became president. The uh, Democratic Party failed to defeat George H.W. Bush uh, at a point where, right after Iran-Contra, where he should have been defeated. The Democratic Party failed to stop, although it's important to note that Al Gore actually got more votes, but fa failed to stop George, a George W. Bush in 2000, um, when it was quite clear that he was dramatically less experienced and dramatically unprepared for the presidency. In fact, really a willing stooge of uh, Dick Cheney rather than, than his own man. And in 2016, the Democratic Party, though again, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, was unable to prevent Donald Trump from becoming president of the United States. Uh, and in 2020, despite everything that's on, in play, the Democratic Party uh, barely got control of the US Senate and fell back in its position in the US House. Uh, this is something Democrats have to think about. And I'm not here to beat up on the Democratic Party one way or the other. I'm just to say, to say that, that when Democrats come to power, they have to think more about how they use power. And that's the moment at which we find ourselves. Uh, Democrats now have, thanks to the voters of Georgia, and what a week it's been, by the way, if you imagine that, that this Georgia vote was only Tuesday and it seems like a thousand years ago. But thanks to the voters of Georgia, and frankly, thanks to Stacey Abrams and a number of other organizers, the Democrats now have control of the Senate. It's not an overwhelming control. It's a bizarre sort of difficult calculus where uh, you'll have a 50-50 split. And thank you, California, for sending Kamala Harris to the uh, White House. Uh, she will, as president of the Senate, uh, break that tie and, and give Democrats control. But it will be a difficult control. We have to acknowledge that. In the House, it will be complex. There will be challenges. But Joe Biden can govern. And uh, that ability to govern is a huge deal. It's, it's incredibly consequential. What uh, the Georgia vote on Tuesday did was give Biden the likelihood, not the certainty, but the likelihood that he will have his full cabinet. That's an incredible thing. Because if, it, if that hadn't happened, I promise you, there would have been objections to many of the members of, of the cab, potential members of the cabinet, and there would have been uh, a, there better, would have been refusals by some committee chairs to schedule hearings in a timely way. That would have prevented uh, Biden from literally getting his government going at at a uh, appropriate uh, rate. And so this is a very big deal just in that regard. It will also make judicial appointments easier. Uh, both advancing them and getting getting the votes to confirm them. It's still going to be hard, but it will be easier. Uh, it will also make policy somewhat easier. Although if they don't deal with, do away with the abuses of the filibuster as they currently exist, uh, the Republicans will still have many, many options for how to slow down policy initiatives. And that's something that, that ought to be considered. Ultimately though, what uh, Democrats need to do, I would argue, and what I do argue in my book is, uh, is to recognize that when they have the kind of power that they have, and this is governing power, they have to do two things. Number one, they have to expand democracy. And that means that they have to take actions that, that will make it easier to vote, uh, easier to participate in the process, that will make it easier to organize a union, that will make it easier uh, to engage in social activism. These are all things that are, are contained in bills. It can be done. Uh, they should move quickly with a package of legislation that expands democracy and frankly, that rewards those who seek to expand it. That's good for the Democrats as the Georgia result proves. Making it easier to vote, getting more people to the polls does matter. Um, but that can't be the only goal. The, the primary responsibility beyond that structural shift is to respond to the pandemic and to respond to the mass unemployment that extends from it as well as all the other issues I'd listed a little bit ago. Uh, I think you will see very quickly an effort to do the $2,000 payments that were delayed uh, before uh, the Georgia vote. And uh, that's good. That's good that, that to get resources to people. We're in a country where there are people going hungry, where you have homelessness and other challenges. So that's an important part of it. But then they have to go uh, to the most important part. I noticed that many of the people who are on board with us today are uh, local elected officials. And you know full well that the biggest problem with the stimulus that came through at the end of December was that it did not provide resources for state and local government. 
this is the critical thing that has to happen uh, in the first days of the new Congress. State and local governments across this country have been in the front line of dealing with the pandemic. They've been in the front line of dealing with unemployment and they are frankly stretched to the limit. They cannot survive as functioning entities, at least as functioning entities to the level that they need to be uh, without an immediate response from the federal government, immediate action in that regard. And that has to be a big, big focus of the first days of this new administration. Um, the last thing that I would suggest though is that, that it's gonna be a balancing act. And uh, there are so many demands, so many things that need to be done. What's really vital at this point is for the Biden administration and the new Congress to have regular victories. There has to be a sense that government works, that it matters. Pramila Jayapal, the new chair of the uh, Congressional Progressive Caucus, uh, had a very good essay in The Nation last week in which she said, you know, look, one of the things you have to understand about the success of Donald Trump and frankly, the success of, of uh, Republicans is that there are an awfully lot of people who don't believe government can work anymore, but they've given up on government. And as a result, uh, they say, yeah, why not vote for the party that, that proposes to dismantle it or that messes with it in all sorts of ways. And, and her point is well taken. Democrats in power have to show that government works and that it's on the side of working class people. And that means it has to make major strides as regards economic and social and racial justice, saving the planet, and frankly, dialing down the military industrial complex. That's not easy. It'd be easier if you had a much bigger majority. I accept that. But I can tell you without a doubt, if Democrats do not deliver in a big way, now that they have power, they run the very real risk of having a repeat of a, of a very bad trend, a very bad pattern that I wrote about in my book. And it's important to understand that in 1946, Harry Truman had a substantial majorities in the House and Senate, the Democrats had the presidency, but Truman governed in a very cautious way, especially in the early years of his administration. He jettisoned a lot of the new dealers and he ended up in a situation where he lost governing control, lost the House and the Senate, and in short order, you got the Taft-Hartley Act. Similarly, along the way, we have saw Jimmy Carter in the first years of his administration governed cautiously. Uh, midterm elections lost a lot of his ground in the US Senate. Two years later, lost the presidency. 1992, Bill Clinton comes into power with uh, solid majorities in the House and Senate. Again, Democrats had the presidency, but Clinton governed in, a, in often a very neoliberal way. Uh, his trade policies especially were very uh, popular with Republicans in Wall Street, but not with a lot of working class people. And in 1994, you ended up with Democrats losing control uh, or losing their, their governing position in Congress. Similarly, when Barack Obama became president, and I think Barack Obama tried harder to do bigger things, but there were a tremendous number of compromises. There was a tremendous number of pushback. And frankly, he was counseled by people like Rahm Emanuel to pull his punches rather than, than to throw them. And uh, 19 or 2006, or I'm sorry, 2010, uh, Democrats lost their governing position in the Congress. Uh, it, it fell back further in 2014. And so six of Barack Obama's eight years as president uh, were with a Congress that would not work for him with him and that actively sought to obstruct him. This is the history that uh, Joe Biden and, and the Democrats have to be conscious of. They cannot govern cautiously. They cannot pull their punches. This is a time where they have to be very serious about governing in a big way, delivering in a big way, and finally, in holding to account those people uh, in the Trump administration associated with it that brought us into the very difficult position we find ourselves in today. Uh, with that, uh, and looking at our time, I think I, I kept us right about in the, in the range that we had sought to uh, work in. And so we'll uh, open it up to your questions and I'm super excited to, to interact with folks and so honored to join you today. Excellent, John, thank you. Yeah, let's, let's give uh, jazz hands. Ah. And uh, Peter, uh, I, I have a number of questions myself, but I, I want our members to go first. Well, that sounds like a good plan to me, Craig. Thank you very much. Um, so why don't we do that? Um, so uh, we did have one question that, um, one of our other guests actually uh, got into mentioning, but um, we were curious regarding impeachment. Okay. Um, can the impeachment, or will do you think the impeachment, or do, do, do the current uh, impeachment um, uh, documents uh, call for uh, President Trump to be uh, ineligible to run, for running for office ever again? 
Is that a part of the impeachment? Yeah, it's an interesting. That's an interesting question that is somewhat underinterpreted. Um, it's not about uh, what the documents say. It's it's the question of whether impeachment and removal from office bars you from seeking the office again, and uh, it's simply by the fact of the impeachment and removal. And there is uh, this is in fact uh, generally viewed as being a part of the the process that if he were to be removed, he would be barred uh, from running again. However, however, uh, you do have to get beyond the actual vote of impeachment to that, that removal. That means you've got to have uh, two thirds of the Senate vote to do that. I, I fear to say that's a pretty high barrier to get to. I think you're gonna, if you do go through the current impeachment and get to the Senate, uh, I think that you will have Republican votes for impeachment. How many becomes a very interesting question. Uh, I think you can count on Mitt Romney. And frankly, I will bet you that there would be, you know, striking number of additional members. I just don't know how many. Uh, but the notion that you're going to get to 67, which is what you're looking for, um, is, is a daunting one. So I, I hate to disappoint our questioner there uh, and suggest to you that every indication is that we're going to be dealing with Donald Trump in the future. Uh, and But, but uh, it's not just impeachment, but there are many other avenues uh, where Donald Trump might be held to account. And I, I do think that there are arguments for his prosecution on many of the issues that have already been raised, uh, including, of course, uh, the, uh, the financial dealings that New York prosecutors are looking at and things of that nature. But also, frankly, just the recent actions, incitement to violence uh, is a big deal. And I hope that the Attorney General of the District of Columbia looks at these issues and considers uh, whether there is uh, an argument for a, a prosecution there. I think it's within the realm of reason. So Donald Trump will be around. I'm quite sure that he's not going to disappear. In fact, he tweeted this morning that he's not going away. Um, but by the same token, there are a lot of actions that can be taken to hold him to account. And I frankly do believe that what happened this week uh, will make it much harder for him to reposition as a 2024 candidate or something like that. I think we'd all agree that getting to two thirds vote in the Senate or any body of any human beings on earth is a very difficult uh, challenge, especially for anyone who's ever run a two thirds campaign before you all know that. Um, Except in this meeting, I bet we could get to two thirds in this meeting. I bet you we could, <laughs> I, bet you we could get to, I bet you we could get to some level of agreement. Um, following up on that, if you could, uh, what do you think are the chances of the vice president and then the cabinet invoking the 25th amendment? And we actually had a question talking about this last night as a sort of follow up. Do you happen to know if, um, given that we've had some resignations, can would acting yeah. cabinet member, cabinet- Ah, you know, very good questions. Okay, to first, of, terrific question. First and foremost, no chance. I hate to tell you. I mean, and I'm glad, I'm gonna be thrilled if I'm proven wrong in five minutes, which is, I'm, you know, I'm gonna say it very firmly in hopes that I'll be immediately proven wrong. I'm getting a tweet uh, right now, hold on. That is Mike Pence coming in. Um, but. I just don't think there's a chance of it. Uh, and, and that's the flaw in the 25th Amendment. It's, it says, you know, look, we've got this structure, but it requires the people who've been appointed by the president to say to the president, you gotta go. And, uh, and, and some, I think, might. But the idea that you'd get a, a majority of the cabinet or some sort of unified uh, response there is a really tough goal. I've always thought that was a flaw in the 25th Amendment, and, and it's, it's one of the many flaws. And so here's the bottom line as regards the, the, the formally certified members of the cabinet. Those are people who've been vetted by the US Senate and been approved versus all these hangers on who you know, are kind of filling cabinet positions because they're so-called interim or, or not formally there. Bottom line, as best I can interpret, and this is something that has not been adjudicated in a very real way because it hasn't happened before, as best I can interpret, um, the, you would have to really be talking about the members of the cabinet who've been confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So that's a, a handful of members, you know, Scalia, Labor, and a couple of others. There's so few left, right, because so many have quit. Bill Power's out, and, and uh, we, you know, unclear on the Secretary of Defense. We've got you know, DeVos is gone. Now we've got Elaine Chow gone. But, you know, there's still a handful. Ben Carson is still there. Um, and so at, at some fundamental level, I think you'd be stuck with a handful of people, generally Trump loyalists, who wouldn't, wouldn't go along with Pence, even if Pence was trying to do the right thing. 
Mm. And so I'm not anticipating that's where we're going to end up. And this does get to one of my, as somebody who's written a lot about presidential accountability, one of my great frustrations is I don't like it when members of Congress say, oh, do the 25th Amendment, right? Because it's like if I had a car, right, and I could go get, you know, snacks for this meeting, and I said, no, I want Peter to go do it. Go, so Peter, you go get, you go get the snacks and you pay for them, right? There you go. We lost them there. And, um, and it's like, why do I expect you to do it when I have the car and I've got the resources to go do it? It's members of Congress keep going, yes, yeah, somebody ought to do the 25th Amendment. Somebody else ought to do this thing because they don't want to take the basic responsibility to impeach. And they have the power and impeachment is a much more flexible and much more coherent power despite the partisan challenges. So um, I'm not going to delay it anymore, but I'm not a fan of the 25th Amendment. Not to worry about that. No, thank you for, for that, though. And I think, I, I again, I think a lot of us would agree that uh, neither of these options is likely to actually come to full fruition. Sadly. I, I do think I, it's a safe bet that the, the House will vote to impeach, um, but whether or not the Senate will confirm it is, I, I think, in severe doubt. Um, so assuming that, and assuming that President Trump uh, is president um, all the way through, if he would like, until January 20th at noon, um, one question, do you think he may resign uh, on the night of the 19th and have uh, Mr. Pence um, pardon him from any future federal prosecution? And follow-up question, um, if uh, Mr. Pence were not to do that or if the president decided to and he decided to pardon himself, what do you think are the chances that the Supreme Court would uphold that? Superb questions, both. Um, I don't think that the president at this point trusts Pence. So I'm not sure that he would, we would resign and give it to Pence on the expectation that Pence would pardon him, because I don't think that he necessarily trusts Pence at this point. If you looked at the rally on Wednesday that, where the president, frankly, incited the crowd to go to the Capitol, uh, he wasn't exactly praising Mike Pence there. And, uh, and I think that, that Trump's inner circle is very uncomfortable with Mike Pence. And that's and there I'm talking about Meadows and, and you know, a handful of you know, the real, the kind of hardliners around the president. And so I, I don't anticipate uh, the president resigning on the 19th. If he trusted Pence to do it, I would not rule that out because I rule nothing out with, with Donald Trump at all. And, and certainly you know, anything that you say can't happen with Donald Trump is, has either already happened or is likely to happen. Um, and so uh, it's just because of the trust level with Pence that I think is the issue. So that gets us to the self-pardon. And uh, the self-pardon is, a, is a, again, something that's never been adjudicated, something we've never dealt with in any kind of realistic way. But tragically, there has been some acceptance of past pardons uh, done with the purpose of preventing investigations, preventing uh, accountability for a president. And you saw George H.W. Bush do some of that, um, again, working with uh, Barr uh, 30 years ago. And so uh, I, there's been a little bit of acceptance of that. There's no evidence, frankly, that a president's self-pardon would necessarily stand. It would, I think, go to the courts. There's no doubt of that. Lawrence Tribe, who I've talked to about this and you know, interacted with on this, uh, believes that, that it's, it, it won't stand, that you can't do it. And many legal scholars will tell you that this notion of pardoning in advance, i.e. pardoning for things that you haven't been charged with, is a particularly you know, undoable uh, reality. Um, but it does bring us back to the Nixon pardon by Ford and that had some elements of that and was complicated. So the bottom line is, I think there is a very good likelihood that Donald Trump will self-pardon. Uh, and I think he will pardon a lot of his family members, and a lot of people around him. And then I think that that will take us into the courts. And it's another way that we'll be dealing with Trump for a long time into the future. But I will emphasize that a self-pardon does not get you out of trouble with the state of New York. And that Tish James, the very good attorney general of the state of New York, uh, seems to be quite determined to pursue investigations. And so I think Mr. Trump will end up in court at some point or another. And again, I wouldn't mind if he ended up in DC court on a charge of inciting violence. Excellent. Um, so I guess, uh, there's a pretty robust dialogue in the chat, I will say right now, regarding the 25th Amendment uh, and or impeachment. Um, what are your thoughts, generally speaking, this is from David uh, Ginsburg, uh, 
on um, is impeachment you know, worth their, worth their time at this point with with you know with I think the idea is it's there's two weeks left. Um, yeah. Is it worth going through the process and, and getting further divided, or should we start bringing thing bring quote unquote bringing folks together? Or as one of our other members posits, is impeachment necessary to set the precedent that this is just not acceptable behavior? Uh, so. First off, let me uh, note to David, because I'm looking at his, I, I can read the chat here too, and I think that his list of things that should be dealt with, COVID crisis, the economy, electoral reform, DC statehood, is a fantastic list. And yes, uh, if they were in a position to do all those things in the next week, I would say go for it. You know, I, I definitely, if you can, particularly if you could get the vaccines to everybody in the next week, I'd be really thrilled. Um, but Congress is actually technically not, in, not even there. They're, they all left after the riot and everything and headed home. And so they have to be called back into session. If they were called back into an extraordinary session, it would be for impeachment. It wouldn't be to do all these other things. And so then we get to this. So it's not like they're putting something aside in order to impeach. We're in a transition period and um, you know we have this issue. I happen to be very strongly of the view that precedent matters and that the impeachment of the president for what he has done just in, as outlined in Ilhan Omar's impeachment resolution is not only appropriate, but necessary. Congress has to kind of grow up. It has to be a big kid entity. And uh, one of their duties is to hold presidents to account when they do wrong. There's not a timeline on impeachment. It's not like, oh, you can't do it in the last month or the last week. No, it's, it's, it's a very well understood power. And I think it should be applied. So I have zero problem with doing it. And I think frankly, there's a lot of energy around it in the Congress right now, because remember, these people were sheltering in place. They were, they were you know, literally being led out of rooms with people with guns uh, in just moments ago. And so I think there's a real desire to, to make a statement and to say, this is unacceptable. It's unacceptable uh, in the, this circumstance. It's unacceptable in the future. And frankly, as one of the other people is asking about, it's a message for the rest of the world. I mean, I, it says, you know, and, and we should not lose sight of that. It says, you know, this is fundamentally unacceptable and, and that it's dangerous and bad. And so I favor the impeachment. I favor going forward with it, even if it is a, a, a you know, difficult process that may not get seen to co completion. Remember, you know nothing, absolutely nothing about Andrew Johnson, Lincoln's uh, vice president, successor, except that he was impeached. You know, I, maybe there's a couple Andrew Johnson scholars on the call and I'll, <laughs> I'll defer to them. But, the, you know, and I ask people about Andrew Johnson, the only thing they know is that he was impeached. Well, and I would not mind if a hundred years from now, the only thing anybody knows about Donald Trump is that he was impeached twice. So I'm, you know, I'm pretty enthusiastic for the idea. Well, for better or worse, Andrew Johnson didn't have Twitter. So uh, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> More of a record yeah. these days. Um, I do want to get to, I know Craig had a couple of questions. I know Bill James has a question, but um, just we're right there. So I want to uh, actually ask because there's questions in the chat that we've led, uh, we've led right into. And um, getting off maybe sort of uh, what's going to happen with Mr. Trump, when Mr. Biden and Ms. Harris take over uh, uh, leadership, what do you see are some key policy initiatives they could uh, begin to move on with the new I don't want to say the new Senate because it's pretty much yeah. divided and they still need 60 votes to get a lot of the big stuff anyway. But, you know, the control of the Senate uh, and control of the White House, what are some issues they can move on? And building off of that, if you could talk to speak to, are there issues or are there policies that they can tackle now that could potentially reach out to this disaffected population in America right now that just feels like they're left out by everyone and have been right. manipulated by Trump and his cronies and his used car salesmen into thinking that they are the answer? Is there something that Democrats can do to prove that we are the answer, to, that we are here to help and then hopefully help to heal the wounds and, and build a bigger electoral uh, tent? Terrific question. Uh, yes, is the answer. And uh, weirdly enough, weirdly enough, um, the combination of Ro Khanna and Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump uh, and the moment we are in has created the easiest way to start. And that is the $2,000 payments. Uh, there are, and I, I'll acknowledge there may be a number of people on this call who don't need the $2,000 payment, right? That their lives are okay and it's, it's fine. 
but a universal $2,000 payment going out to every American, you know, up to you know a reasonable income level, uh, is is a signal that that the federal government understands that we have a tremendous number of Americans who are hurting right now, and that there are people going hungry, there are people threatened with eviction, there are all sorts of other challenges. And frankly, our economy is in a very unstable place. The job creation is not where it needs to be. There's all sorts of other challenges. So getting that money out and doing so, uh, it's not the perfect solution. I, I'm not here to tell you it's, it's even, you know, it's not even ideal in many ways, but it's real and it gets resources to people in a time when they are in pain. If Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and their allies come to power and deliver that in the first week, um, I can tell you right off the bat that will that will be noticed by a, a hell of a lot of people, and it's a it's a good way to start. It's to say what couldn't happen in the last administration, the last Senate can happen now, and and there's nothing more important in the sense that action can occur. And also, I will emphasize that that two thousand dollar payment needs to be universal. Don't make it something that's you know only to these people who are hurting or those folks, because at the end of the day. Then you end up in this, this game where they will always try to, you know, kind of squeeze it down. They'll cheat the unemployment benefits to pay for it. You know, it's, it, there, Congress works in ugly, nasty ways. The austerity hawks, the deficit hawks are always there looking for a way around it. And so here's a, this is a simple way to do it. Say, got a new president, you got a new Senate, you're gonna get your $2,000 check. And so that's a starting point. And then moving forward from that, I do think that the, saving local government, state and local government. That isn't as sexy. You know, it's sexier to get a check, right? I understand. But saving state and local government is absolutely critical to guaranteeing that we get the vaccine out right, guaranteeing that we deal with the, the lingering reality of the pandemic, and guaranteeing that we have models and, and approaches that can deal with mass unemployment and the downturn in businesses. This is so huge. And I would, you know, I would hope that Joe Biden, who has an inclination toward bipartisanship, for better or worse, um, I would hope that you know he flies a hundred Republican mayors and city council presidents and town council presidents and school board members into Washington, and they do a big, if you can do that in the COVID era, and to do a great big message that bailing out state and local governments, getting them the resources they need, is you know that's going to help more Republican controlled communities than it will Democratic controlled communities because at the end of the day, the vast majority of America's townships and villages that are led usually by, they're very small, but they are led by, you know, Republicans. And so uh, the absurdity of denying that funding, it, it was, it was cruel. It was stupid. It was wrongheaded. I can't, I'm looking for my uh, adjectives here or verbs or whatever. Um, but the bottom line is that would be a very big thing. And it frankly, would be very popular uh, with a lot of people that matter. So there's a couple of starting points. And frankly, in it's one way Biden has already started. And that is uh, seeking to get a reasonable level of diversity in his cabinet, um, putting women and people of color in, in key positions. This is absolutely vital. It's not the solution to the crisis, but uh, it is a, a vital response to um, the reality that systemic racism has uh, denied this country a lot of progress for a very long time. And so quick action in those areas matters as well. Excellent. And yeah, I, uh, I was, my wife and I were just thinking the other night of how wonderful it would be when uh, Kamala Harris can stare Mitch McConnell in the eye as the tie-breaking vote and just say, sorry. Oh, yeah. um, oh no, and, and can I just pause for a second? Thanks, California, for giving us Kamala Harris. Um, you know, she's been, she's taken criticism and I, and I respect some of the critiques of her uh, for some of her record. But the fact of the matter is, uh, she proved to be a very, very effective uh, candidate for vice president of the United States. And there is every indication that she can and will be a very, very powerful and effective vice president of the United States. And to be there as uh, a, a, a woman with her background, right, uh, an immigrant background, person of color, uh, Southern Asian, as well as Caribbean, uh, all of this, this is, this is exactly what we need right now. Um, and I, I give, I give uh, Biden credit for picking her. 
from the great state of California. Um, okay. So I, uh, Craig, I know you had a few questions burning up the, the chat line. So why don't you go ahead and ask, ask away? All right, uh, John, uh, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you on behalf of all of us about the F word. In this context, that would be filibuster. Oh, yeah. What's that? In this context, that would be filibuster. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. They should get rid of it. What do we do um, about the filibuster? Because absent that, I mean, it's almost worse that we're nominally in control of the Senate if the filibuster can stop us from accomplishing anything because the general public, all they're going to hear is that, well, you had control of the whole government and you didn't do anything. So that's what a very good, deep insight. And you're exactly right. Um, the filibuster is a, it's a disaster. It's, it's, it's a mess and it's so routinized. There's a new book out about the filibuster. It's quite good. It's written by a former aide to Harry Reid. And, and what it points out is just how routinized it has become. You don't even have to, you don't have to go to the floor and do the filibuster. You don't even have to, you don't even have to tell the leader. You just call a hotline. You can literally, an aide calls a hotline and says, oh, we want to block this. And, and suddenly everything's jammed up. So no, we have to, we should end the filibuster. Um, doesn't mean that you should get rid of all the rules, but it does mean that you should recognize that there are rules and structures in the Senate that are meant at this point to maintain a status quo that doesn't work. And, and Jeff Merkley, I would, I would encourage people to follow Jeff Merkley, the Senator from Oregon. He is the leader on Senate reform and dealing with the filibuster. He's gonna fight very, very hard on this. And, uh, and he's the hero on it. He's the right player. You got some Democrats that are resistant uh, including, I think, maybe Joe Manchin from West Virginia. This is going to be a real heavy lift for uh, Chuck Schumer. I've talked, I've interviewed Schumer and talked to him over over the years. Um, it's he knows the challenge that he's in. Uh, I think Schumer recognizes that to govern effectively, they've got to do some reforms in the Senate. And and I, I'm cautiously optimistic that you can get there. Although it's hard with a 50-50 split. One, if one Democratic senator goes against you, you're in trouble. Um, what is encouraging is that two of the new members who were elected, Raphael Warnock, uh, Pastor Warnock, and uh, John Ossoff are going to be, uh, they will arrive with a message for the Senate, for Democrats in the Senate, and that is they need to do things. They need to get things done. Because the fact is that Warnock and Ossoff won in Georgia, A, because of the years of organizing by Stacey Abrams and others, but and B, because Donald Trump was a complete mess and kind of derailed everything. But C, very, very importantly, it was because the Senate didn't do those $2,000 checks. I think if, if McConnell had gotten out of the way and allowed the $2,000 checks to go, I still think Leffler would have been beaten by Raphael Warnock, but I think there's an outside chance that David Perdue might have survived politically. And so I think that that, that was a part of what happened in Georgia. It was a message that if this Senate doesn't function, we're going to try and send two people to Washington, give the majority, and make it function. Democrats ought to get that message, and they ought to make the rule changes that make it possible. Thanks. Right, did you have a follow-up question? I, he, well, I, I, I wanted to uh, ask him about uh, a somewhat more arcane, but I think extremely powerful agency in the government, uh, which <clears throat> could help with uh, the, pro the log jam and the problems that we have with our media. Uh, what could Biden do? If you could wave a magic wand and tell, and tell uh, Biden what to do with the FCC, the Federal <laughs> Communications Commission, to break up some of these big monopolies, to reinstate the fairness doctrine, whatever, what, 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 could, what could we do? Well, first off, appoint good people to it. Um, over the last four years, we've had a terrible chair of the FCC. Yeah. Who's been essentially an acolyte, not just of Trump, but of the telecom companies. And so it's a, been a disastrous situation. The FCC is really powerful. There's a lot of possibilities there. And what you wanna have is crusading members who are ready to really fight uh, on a host of media diversity and, and frankly, uh, media survival issues. The truth of the matter is that our media system is collapsing. Uh, the loss of advertising revenue has made it uh, almost impossible for newspapers to survive. Local TV stations are becoming, you know, essentially weather reporting operations and, and not enough coverage of, of everything else that's going on. Radio has been congealed and conglomerated. That's not all going to be fixed by the FCC. I want to emphasize the FCC doesn't have power to do all that, but the FCC can become a driving force as regards competition and diversity in broadcast media. 
And frankly, they have an immense amount of power in building out broadband and doing so in a universal access, with a universal access approach. It's really, really important. So good appointments there is vital. But if I could have um, the, the president wave a wand, the first thing I would do would be, uh, I would have him establish a system where we can save local media across this country because we don't need more coverage of Washington, though it's valuable. We need local media to be strong in places like San Jose and San Francisco and Los Gatos. It has to be, you know, you have to have reporters out there on the ground doing the job. And with the loss of advertising revenue, that's becoming difficult. How could you do it? You could adopt models from other countries. For instance, uh, the idea of having, giving everybody a $200 tax credit uh, which you can, it, you can use it to write off your subscriptions to local newspapers, uh, to support uh, independent not-for-profit radio, community radio, things of that nature. There are all kinds of models. Free Press, the group I'm involved with, uh, has you know, scoped out a lot of these and talked about them. It's doable. We can save local media in this country. And frankly, we need to. So if I could give the president a wand, uh, I'd have him uh, save, make the changes that would save local media. Because uh, frankly, if we have functional local media, issues like QAnon and all these other things become less of a factor because people can get a lot of quality information about things that they are interested in from media that they trust. And that's, that's something that's, that's kind of falling apart in a lot of the country right now. Thank you, John. I, uh, Craig, I just wanted to know we're a little bit after one, so I thank everyone for sticking around. And John, if you could, just for a few more minutes, but I think we have- Sure, just give you, more. yeah, yeah, give a few more. Um, so I know that uh, our, uh, I think I see Forrest Williams has his hand raised. I don't know, Forrest, if you were waiting to, to say a word, but I can unmute you if you want, or if you're just, if you're just stretching your arm, you can let me know. <laughs> I, I, did, I did see something from Forrest earlier. He wanted to know if we could, oh, here we go. To, I just wanted to ask the, the question about uh, the priorities, uh, like the infrastructure, I think there will be some bill for uh, infrastructure improvements in the United States, which yeah. create a lot of jobs. Uh, the energy uh, sector uh, can create a lot of jobs. Will those be priorities that uh, the uh, Pelosi and the team will really push hard for? What do you think? I think they will, Forrest, and it's a great question. We're probably one of the most important ones. And you get to the heart of something that they can actually unite on. Uh, there's a lot of Republicans who are actually sympathetic to infrastructure. Uh, it's just a matter of doing it right. You don't want it to be a big kind of bailout for, um, right. you know, big contractors. You want it to put people to work and, and make sure that it functions in the right way. Biden actually gets a lot of that. Uh, it's kind of the sort of thing that he wakes up in the morning thinking about more than, more than you might imagine. And so I think it will be a priority of his. I think he'll have an ally in Schumer who's very, very into infrastructure. And a lot of the a lot of the Democrats, both in the House and Senate, mm -hmm. Pete DePazio up from up in uh, Oregon, is uh, in a key position there and is very enthusiastic about it. So yeah, I think you're going to get uh, some infrastructure measures. What's important in this regard, or what what really matters as regards infrastructure, is that it be about creating jobs. You know, it and you want to you obviously want to create what's needed, but it needs to it needs to put people to work. That's going to be a very important thing because I think coming out of uh, the pandemic, what we're going to find is that a lot of companies will have figured out that they don't need as many employees as they thought they did. And uh, many others will have automated and gone to robotification because frankly, robotification, robots don't get sick from pandemics and things of that nature. And so I think we're going to have a real employment challenge in this country and looking for ways to get people to work uh, that make sense and to get things done is going to matter more than it did before the pandemic. It's going to become more of a priority. I do think there's people that understand that. And so I think you're gonna get some of it. The last thing I'm gonna say is that also remember that infrastructure is not merely uh, roads and bridges. It's also at this point, broadband. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of our high tech. And the fact of the matter is that a, a smart infrastructure program uh, has many, many aspects to it. And I would hope that, uh, that the Biden administration recognizes this. At this point, our broadband gap is one of the biggest moral gaps that we have because uh, we literally have a situation where rural kids and sometimes big city kids are in a position where they can't access internet at a time when we're doing virtual schooling. It's insanity. It's, it's a terrible inequality. It's going to set a generation of kids back because of this last year. And that's something we need to address. First and foremost, it ought to be at the very top of priorities that no one in the United States 
is uh, digitally uh, disempowered, right? That, they, that you're not connected. And if you think that's impossible, I invite you to go to South Korea. In South Korea, they have established a system where no matter where you are, the most urban or rural place in that country, you're gonna have better internet connections than you can probably get in the Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So the, the fact of the matter is governments can do that and that ought to be you know, not job one. Job one is getting the vaccine out and doing some of that, but it ought to be about you know job two. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I raise the question is that it would be an excellent opportunity to reach across party lines yep. and, bring, and, and show that whatever we propose that is doable and it's inclusive and all of that. So I, that's why I was asking the question that we could use this as a tool to reach across the aisle and really uh, get to the other people to show them that it works. You're right. I couldn't agree with you more. And you get into the heart of what, what I think is the big deal. I, I think that Democrats have power. They don't have a lot of power, but they got power. They had better show that government works. It's not just about showing that they work. They better show right. that government works. Right. Uh, because if they don't, in 2022, you're going to have Republicans right back there saying, yeah, see, we gave them power, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, and because there are so many people hurting in America right now, mm -hmm. uh, that's a very dangerous game. Populism cuts both ways, to the right and to the left. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that Democrats in power have to recognize is that they have to be progressive populists. And they have to do things that are popular. And what's popular is building out infrastructure, putting people to work, giving people a measure of security. Um, you know, and frankly, I will tell you also, the basic concept, economic and social and racial justice is outlined by in the, you know, for generations, still has tremendous appeal. It's not, these things aren't, that agenda isn't unpopular. It's very, very popular polling shows, but you'd have to deliver on it. The problem isn't that people don't want it. The problem is people don't think they can get it. And so proving you can get things done is huge. So yes, thank you for us for taking us there. Thank you. Um, we do uh, have to wrap things up. I have one more question from our illustrious county party chair, Mr. Bill James. However, I do want to lead into that by noting um, if you haven't already seen the, the link, I'm happy to post it again, but um, please join or renew your dues um, with the Century Club. I will do that. And I point that out because he had to leave, I think, but um, Patrick Aarons was on earlier. He's with the Foothill De Anza Community College District Board. He's also a member of the Century Club and he decided to rejoin this year at a, an even higher level um, to give a little extra. Um, so I, I wanted to thank Patrick for doing that. And I know that Mr. James also did that as well this year. So thank you, Bill. Um, and Bill, if you have a, a question, I think you can wrap up our Q&A and then we can let everyone have their, their afternoons. So I will, um, thank you very much, Peter. Um, John, thank you so much for this discussion. I think it's like really timely for us and the chaos that happened in the Capitol and the hopefulness yeah. that we have now that we've won in Georgia and we've got Biden and Paris coming in. So just right, so thank you very much. The soul of the Democratic Party. Uh, as a leader, I sometimes get these questions or I sometimes get squeezed between uh, progressives who want and are angry that the Democratic Party isn't putting it out there and doing more, and uh, moderates that you know, so-called moderates uh, or establishment Democrats who say, "But we have to have uh, uh, the uh, senator from West Virginia. We have to have the congressman from Western Pennsylvania. We can't put our leaders in the position where their majorities are lost because we lose these marginal moderate uh, Democrats." So, is there a right answer? I, I agree with you that we have to show the government works, and does that mean? We take the chance, we go full progressive and full Bernie Sanders, full Ro Khanna, and we hope that that creates the constituency that we need, although it might look different, or do we have to be cautious to keep these majorities? Uh, it's a terrific question. I'm so glad you asked it. Obviously, I wrote a book on this and I came down on the side of full progressive. So, I, you know, I show my cards up front. Um, but I think that there's, you know, there are practicalities in it. You want the Democratic Party to be a big enough coalition that it can win elections. And, and the question is, well, how do you do that? And I think that we have an answer, not, it, my book is, it makes a fine holiday gift. And, and, you know, there's still many, many people that you probably didn't get presents to this year. So. And I uh, highly uh, recommend it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. But with that said, with that said, the best evidence may not be in my book. It may be in, coming from the state of Georgia just the other day. Um, exactly. Georgia Democrats did not nominate yeah, for years. Georgia Democrats have been trying to win those Senate seats for a very long time. Right. And again and again and again, I covered the races. They nominated very cautious kind of centrist people who ran campaigns that weren't very exciting. 
And it was sort of like, well, we're a little bit better than the Republicans, so vote for us, right? And so they really tried to appeal to the middle. They tried to find that the last swing voter in Georgia, and it failed miserably, cycle after cycle after cycle. This time around, they ended up nominating a 33-year-old Jewish guy who had been an aide to John Lewis and a 51-year-old Black guy who literally held the pulpit at the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s spiritual home, Ebenezer Baptist Church. And that would not have been the model that Democrats, even a few years ago, would have thought was going to be the winning strategy in Georgia. It proved to be the winning strategy. They got into the runoffs. Runoffs are supposed to be terribly hard for Democrats. They won the runoffs. And they won it, frankly, on a pretty progressive platform, especially Reverend Raphael Warnock. It's important to look at you know, both his history and you know, what he stood for in this campaign. It's very, very progressive in Georgia. And what it did was it got both Ossoff and Warnock got a lot of new people to the polls. They built the coalition out and they won. Now, will that work in every state in America? No, there may be some places where it's gonna be harder and you're gonna have local variations where people you know, do, their best, uh, do their best to win. But the fact of the matter is what Georgia proved is Democrats can win almost anywhere and they can win as progressives, not as, not as you know, sort Republican of- Republican line. Yeah, exactly. So I, I will be writing a lot about this in the future. Uh, I think this is, this is just practical. It's not, it's not ideology. It is practical that you got to stand for something. It's got to be big. And if I can offer one last notion too, Democrats and progressives have to learn a word. And that word is necessary. They need to start to frame their agendas and the things they are proposing as necessary not as something they want, not as something they desire, not as something that's a good idea, not as something they favor because they're smarter than everybody else. No, they have to be talking about what is necessary. Medicare for all is necessary. You can't, when you tie healthcare to employment, we saw what happened with the, the pandemic, it's been disastrous. So Medicare for all is necessary. A Green New Deal is necessary because we have a planet that has a very short amount of time, we've got to act there but also we have to create the jobs of the future. Uh, Racial justice is necessary. We have a country where we continually fail at the basic, basic standard of treating every American uh, with a a baseline of equality and a baseline of of shared opportunity. That has to be dealt with because we we are undermining the potential of the whole country and harming people in ways that is simply immoral. And so, you know, you run down the list of realities and I'll go right to, I'll close off with uh, Barbara Lee and her proposal for a substantial cut in the Pentagon budget. You know, the interesting thing is that um, the Congress and even Democrats in Congress are incredibly resistant to cutting the Pentagon budget. And yet the polls show people don't have a problem with it at all. People actually like the idea. And this includes well into the Republican base. There's a lot of folks who think, yeah, there's a lot of bloat there. And so the fact is, There just has to be a little more courage and the way to kind of get your courage up is by talking about what is necessary, but not what you want, but what what is clearly needed. And so I think progressives, the answer to your question, Bill, I think progressives uh, and a progressive Democratic Party can be very, very strong. Um, That doesn't mean that you dismiss centrists. It doesn't mean that you dismiss internal debate. You invite it, you welcome it. And maybe you sort things out in different ways and you come to different perspectives in different places. But at the end of the day, um, this country needs economic and social and racial justice. This country needs to save the planet. And this country needs a new set of priorities that uh, does not put defense contractors ahead of a hungry child. We start to recognize that and frankly have a politics focused on that. I think you're going to find a tremendous number of Americans all over this country that, that share those values. Thank you. Thank you, John. And, and as uh, we'll close it out with that, and as Danielle said in the chat, uh, Connor Lamb uh, from the House of Reps used the word necessary in describing his brutal takedown of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. During the and debate he, the other day. He's a centrist who did pretty good, I would say, the other day. Uh, Very much so. So look, I, I think this is maybe Donald Trump's contribution to all of us. He has made people realize that there, in some cases, there isn't a middle ground. You can't there are some places you don't compromise. 
And it, that's not clear by now after what's happened in this last week. It may never be. But to my mind, uh, I was very impressed with Connor Lamb, who I haven't always agreed with, uh, who stood up and said exactly the right thing. And I will, I'm going to give a quick shout out to, I think, uh, Ann Rosenzweig might be, might be in the chat to, or in the room today, and um, Art Cohen, who just both renewed their dues in the club. So obviously the, <laughs> the program must be, for, John, thank you for the, that fabulous program. And I'll kick it back to Craig for uh, closing remarks. All right. Uh, thank you so much, John. It, it, this was fabulous. Uh, it, uh, it met uh, all, all, of, all of my expectations. Uh, I, I hope for our members as well. Uh, really appreciate your taking the time to be with us. I'm honored to be with you and I'm so thrilled. I think local clubs like this really matter and I'm always uh, glad to come and talk to folks. So I'll, carry on with your good work. I'll, I'll, I'll plug your book one more time. Uh, the latest one is uh, Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party, which I found very inspiring. And I should also mention that John has been very supportive of the California Clean Money Campaign and our efforts to get uh, money out of politics. Thank you again, John. And Thank uh, thanks to all our members for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, please do uh, uh, put uh, renewing your dues uh, high on your to-do list. And uh, we will see you next month. Hang in there and uh, happy better new year. Bye everyone. Take care. Thank you all. See you next month. Thanks, Wayne. Take care. You too. Bye, Peter. <laughs> Bye. Good to see everyone. <laughs> hey, Carol.